I saw that this week. It came across my phone, and as usual, the Lord supplies, and it seemed to fit just this week with this message. I hope each of you got your uh, sermon notes when you come in. This is what we're giving out every week, so you can make notes. There's a lot of scriptures I'll refer to that won't be uh, online, but uh, they will be of importance to you. Lord, it's here later in, in my studies going in a particular direction. Uh, the direction of the heart. I've been a pastor now 46 years, I think. Uh, and this has always been an issue. You know, uh, when we come to a church, you guys, many of you have been sitting in a church longer than I have. But there comes the issue of o obedience. And obedience comes from one place, and that's the heart. That's why I, I entitled my message this morning, The Heart of the Issue is the Heart. When I was reading, I'm reading through the book of Hebrews, I came across what Paul had said in, oh, wait a minute, I may have let something slip. The writer of Hebrews said in chapter 5 into chapter 6, he said, by now, speaking to this group of people, by now, you guys should be teachers. But you need a teacher. And then immediately after that, he says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity. Right after that, he explains what are the elementary or the basic teachings of Christ. Go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith from God, faith, excuse me, faith toward God. And then he talks about the instructions of washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal, and eternal doctrine, the doctrine of eternal life. And I thought, wow, that's, that's wild. Those are the elementary teachings of Christ, the basics. And yet when I think about it, many times... And, and it's not wrong to go through the basics, but undoubtedly, when the, when the writer of Hebrews was saying this, he had something else in mind. I believe that what he had in mind is what Christ had in mind, and that is our life here has got to be looked at as a journey. From the appointment of our birth to the time that God chooses to call us home, that is a journey in life in which we live. And in no reference in the Word of God does it talk about making this a place in which we look at it at any other way than temporary. As I view society, as I hear people talk, as I watch commercials, as I watch a few TV programs, it seems like there seems to be this mood that this is it, guys. This is it. This world is all that we have, and we've got to make the best of it. Uh, you know, even to the, old, the little saying I've heard, the person that winds up with the most toys when they die wins. And I've often wondered, what do they win? One of my favorite singers, Jimmy Buffett. Bless his heart, he got it wrong. He talked about a song, in a song, The Party at the End of the World. And as I heard that song the very first time, I muttered under my breath, Jimmy, there's not a party at the end of the world, son. It's appointed unto man 
to live once, then die and face eternity. So what is it that makes our journey here? There's discouragements. There's a crazy stuff that is going on in the world right now, but if you kind of look back, there's always been crazy stuff in the world. I, I think right now what is happening is that if you view the world as a funnel, the top of that funnel is very wide, and then it begins to go down in size. And I believe the world is slipping down in size towards that appointment that only God and God alone knows. And that appointment is that first taking away of the body of Christ out of this world. And from what I read, when the body of Christ, the church, exit this world, then all hell is really going to break loose because there will be no influence of the character of God. There will be nothing to hold back the evil that is just straining against the bars, it seems like, to be let loose on this earth. We're headed that way. And so if we are headed that way, and it may be, I'm, I'm not a prophet and I'm not prophesying a particular time, the Lord will come back. But what I am saying is close. It's closer now than it ever has been. What makes our journey? Well, it's the heart. The proverb writer in Proverbs 4.4 4 said, He taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. I want you to know there is a distinction about the type of lives that you can live. Breathing air and your ability to get up this morning is one thing. You're, you're alive. You're able to do certain things. As we get older, the things that we can do are kind of restricted. Maybe even not only the things we can do, but the places we can go. We are still alive, but we're not as alive as we were in our youth. You know, they have that medical science deal that so many people have gone through, they can put you on pumps and it can keep your body alive. But my question is, is that living? The same thing goes when you compare a person that has Christ as their Savior. And you need to look at this as not any type of speciality because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we're all born the same way in sin. When Christ begins to convict us of those sins, begin to show us the finality of our life and our inability to even do anything within ourselves to keep His moral law, to please Him in any way, and we surrender that life to Jesus Christ, that new life begins in us, the life of Christ in us. And that is when you really begin to live. And that's what the, this uh, writer had in mind when he said that, keep the words of my commandments in your life and live. Live it to the full, not without problems, not without going through the things everyone else does, but with a different mindset, a different heart set, that the hand of God is literally propelling our life. He goes before us, the Scripture says, and behind us and around us and on top of us. We're encircled in that hand. A life of obedience removes a lot of obstacles in your life. One of the greatest obstacles in a Christian's life is guilt. God never does use guilt to beat you into compliance. When we sin, the Lord sends the Spirit of God that through the Word of God, He convicts us of our sins, and we become aware of those sins. Sins that Christ has forgiven, sins that has caused us to accumulate the dirt of this life, 
And in 1 John 1, 9, we see that when we go to Him and confess those sins, He's faithful. He'll forgive and cleanse. And so the guilt is not what drives us in life. It's the conviction, the power, and the leadership of the Spirit of God in our lives. And so when you keep, as we say, short accounts or walk blamelessly before God, you're able to face the things in this life with a new outlook. You know that God is sovereign and on His throne. You know that God has paid the price for your sin. You know that God has prepared a place in heaven for you. You know your life is in His hands. And that's the safest place to live whereby we live life. Life apart from Christ, and friends, I've left, led both of them, is a life that you live in your own imagination. You simply seek everything that can bring you pleasure. You try to do everything that you can do to keep you from being harmed in any way. But always in the back of your mind, I, I, I have talked with people about this for a long time, in the back of your mind when you are aware, number one, that there is a God and that you are living apart from Him, your life is not living, you're existing, you may accumulate great wealth, you may accumulate great standing, but in the peace of your mind there is no peace. Until you realize, as Paul said, we're justified to have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That same proverb writer also said, keep your heart with all vigilance, for flow from it flows the springs of life. The springs of life. Have you, have you ever gone to a spring? The refreshness of a spring. When I was a kid, and most of this country was woods, Every once in a while, we'd be out in a large place camping and just going from one place to another, and we'd find a spring. And man, I'll tell you, I have never tasted the quality of the water that bubbles from that spring. It's pure, and it's clean, and it quenches your thirst, and you can just wipe your face in it, and there's just a, a sense of refreshing that comes from constant bubbling of springs. This is the reference that Solomon was using from it. Our heart from it can spring the issues of life. That, man, that's a great thought, particularly when later on today, if it doesn't rain, you're going to be faced with Florida's wonderful humidity and high temperatures. Think about that spring when you get there. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 49. We're talking about mindset. We're talking about will. And in the Bible reference, the heart is not just, you know, I love you with all my heart. That's that's not the issue the way the Bible, the Bible points to the heart as more of the will and the mind, okay? Psalms 49. The title in my book says, What Should I Fear in Time of Trouble? And I wondered about that title, and then when I read it, I went back and wondered why, I, why was the title that, and I think it's an issue. Listen. Jesus Christ in your life and obedience to Him takes the fear out of life. Honestly. It's not going to take your problems away, particularly. It's not going to take the junk that's going away. But within you, who you are, how you live, the way you look, that young lady on crutches fooled that fella. He didn't know she was on crutches. She just got up and hung on. That was a heart that was not only springing with bubbling springs, but it was a heart that bubbled over to refresh a very tired old man who could only afford a ticket, no doubt, to stand when he didn't have the strength to stand. Hear this, all people. Give ear, all inhabitants of, of the world both low and high, both rich and poor. So this is for all of us. My mouth shall speak wisdom. 
The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. Understanding the Psalms as they were written were the praise music that we use, that they used then. They sung these through instruments. Now, what is the proverb? I just read you two. What is this proverb that he's talking about? Well, here it is. Why should I fear in times of trouble? I love the writer of the Word of God. They don't mess around. The proverb is this. Why should I fear? And that's a question we all have to answer. Why should I fear? When the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches. Let me quickly this morning talk about, when I talk about wealth and riches, too many times we get the idea that it's a sin to be wealthy and rich. And usually the, uh, we look at that because uh, even in our, our, in our worldly standing, if somebody doesn't have money, they assume that somebody that has something, well, they just are crooked and they got it that way. So there's always been this this poverty war. And let me quickly throw in something that is uh, the Bible teaches. Uh, a government of socialism doesn't cure and narrow the gap between the rich and the poor. It never will. Never has, and it can't. But that's looking at the wealth. I want you to understand this morning that every one of you sitting here, no matter what, how, what bills you have, no matter how much money you bring in, you could move to any one of the many countries of the world and live as a wealthy individual with what you have. We are blessed to be the richest nation in the world. Recently, you uh, talked about going on a, this trip to bring relief to some people, a trip that's right now being canceled because we can't fly. Those people are literally live on nothing. Uh, I showed you last year, in, or this year in February, a picture of a woman in a great mound of dirt. She had a small baby in the wagon, one on her back, and another little boy picking up, and they had a McDonald's sack, and they were picking the scraps of food to put in the bag so that they could go home and share that and eat it. I don't think any of you this morning are going to have to go to the trash heap to find your meal. So we're wealthy. We live in some form of wealth. But listen to this. Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. No matter how much money you got, you can't buy your life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice, that they should live forever and never go down to the pit. I don't care how many miracle cures, how many pills they have, you know, the big thing of go and they stick you in a container and they freeze you and they're going to wake you up later on when whatever disease you had, they find a cure. I, my fear would be this. What if somebody forgets I'm there? I mean, I, think, I mean that's a real fear. What, think about it. I mean, you'd just be a popsicle the rest of your life. I mean, actually, you're, you're dead. Can you see the foolishness that sometimes we go to? For he sees that even the wise man, the fool and the stupid alike, must perish and leave their wealth to others. The graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations. Though they call lands by their own names, men in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beast that perishes. This is a path of those who have foolish confidence. Yet after them, people approve of their boast. Like sheep, all are appointed to Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd. The upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol and no place to dwell. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will revive me. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when, glory, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed, 
And though you get praise when you do well for yourself, your soul will go to the generations of his father who will never again see light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beast that perishes. There's some great teaching in here. Teaching to uplift you. We need to understand everything man tries to accomplish is eventually lost. You remember the striving that we do in this world, the, 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 how we labor. And uh, again, I've never heard a, a man on their deathbed wish that they had another hour to live to go back to the office and work. It doesn't work that way. Everything that we try to accumulate is lost. The Bible has the formula that says to us, we're not to lay up treasures in earth, we're to lay up treasures in heaven. No matter how much you accumulate, you can never purchase your own soul's security. Salvation in Christ is not purchased. It is unmerited grace and mercy given by God that we receive through faith in God. No matter how much glory you accumulate, no matter how much praise, the achievements in life, you don't carry those with you. I mean, if you're in the service and you got medals, or maybe you like plaques where you have been citizen of the year and all of this stuff, they can load those in the casket with you, okay? They can load that casket down and shut it and seal it, but I want to tell you, you've already reached your other destination before that casket is sealed. You don't carry anything out with you. Man in all of our pomp, pomp means all of our wisdom, all in our feeling like we're, we're better. It's just like the beast. We're all going to die. Man can and should learn for the beast. They live each day to the fullest, and they entrust their provision to their Creator, the Psalms, another passage of Scripture, are beautiful as it talks about the Creator providing for the cre creatures that He has created. The beasts are a little smarter than us. They never worry about tomorrow. They don't have a daytimer that tells them their appointments tomorrow. They live day by day. And as I look in the Word of God, we are to live our lives each day as if at the end of the day we would be in the presence of God. Jesus himself said, don't worry about tomorrow. <laughs> you think about today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough stuff out there. Don't worry about it. The beasts are wise. And reading 1 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, love does not seek its own. Love transforms people from selfishness to self-serving illustration you saw on the screen. I found, <laughs> found a couple of tombstones. I got a book on writings on tombstones. You see, we get this selfishness by being born in the world. Little babies are selfish, aren't they? You've worked all day, and it's late at night, and you just go to sleep, but that baby is ready to eat. That baby is tired of that diaper. Or maybe that baby is in the process of training you so that when he screams, you run. You never know what's in a baby's mind. But in Christ, we see the example that he came to serve and not to be served Here's a tombstone in an English cemetery about a miser. Here lies a miser who lived for himself and cared for nothing but gathering wealth. Now where he is or how he fares, nobody knows. Nobody cares. Such an empty tombstone. There's another one in England, General Charles George Gordon who at all times, everywhere, give his strength to the poor, to the weak, his substance to the poor, his sympathy to the suffering, and his heart to God. Can you see the difference between someone's view 
of a life that is spent. The greatest commandment is not a suggestion. We are to love the Lord God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our being. And the only possible way that we can do this is by dying. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about all of us dropping dead this morning. I'm talking about not the dying that we will all face should God delay us coming, but I'm talking about the physical death that each person will face at the end of their life. Wanted man wants to die, live, and after that, the resurrection. When you're called to Christ and you respond to him in saving faith, your old man has died. Now, I understand something. What was really getting in my mind is this way, is sometimes words in the Bible and hard teachings of Christ are attributed to hard sayings. And, and many times they are hard sayings. But it's not what is referred to as Christian lingo. In other words, people accuse us of we have a, we have a foreign language all our own that Christian speaks. And if someone in the world doesn't really understand some of the things we say, if it's, if it's based in Scripture and the way that we, li we live life or view life, well, it is a foreign language to them. Their heart's not, not been regenerated. But dying is the most important first step in your life from Christ. That is the first occurrence. And if you don't realize that, your life will be in turmoil until you die or until you come to that realization. Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians, if any man is in Christ, the if is important. If you are in Christ, you're a new creation instantly. All right? From the time that you come to Christ, you are a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things become new. But the life that we live from that point of coming to Christ until we meet Christ is a journey of walking away from the old life, the old heart, the old things that titillated us, that we loved, the old habits that we had. So we are both instantly a new man and we are progressively a new man. And the problem is in the life of a Christian full of turmoil, a Christian who lacks faith and trust in God is that they are still trying to live the old life in the new body God has given them. The Apostle Paul says the same thing when he's talking about being saved. He said, you are saved. That is the point that Christ comes into your life. You are being saved. There is a process, this process I just talked about, learning who you are, learning who this new man is, yielding to the old, new man, and rejecting the old man. We are in the process of being saved. And then he says, when we reach heaven's shores, we are saved. Boom. That's the finish of the process that began back here. But you see, if we are to really progress, there's got to be some dying. You see, when Christ came on the cross, when he was placed in the grave, when he was powerfully resurrected, he forever broke the chains of sin that binds every child of God. He broke the power of sin. That power was that, that power that Satan used against you every time you decided, you know, I've been, my life is just not worth anything. I, I've just got to straighten this out. He will whistle and call you right back into that old life, that old way. Christ forever broke that. No chains, no cell door. You're new in Christ. Turn to John chapter 12. One of the hard sayings. John chapter 12. I'm going to begin in verse 20. <clears throat> this is after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. 
Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. This is kind of familiar course. If you look through, when anybody wanted entrance into to see Jesus, they go sit find Andrew because they figured somewhere close to Jesus was Andrew. So Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Here's what Jesus said. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I think he's trying to relay to them, to relay to the Greeks that, listen, my hour has come. This is the final week of his life. And then he explained it. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. That simply means it remains a grain of wheat. That's it. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will be kept for eternal life. If anyone serves me, they must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him dying. In 1 Corinthians 15, 36 to 38, you can just write that down. Paul is explaining to the Corinthian church what the resurrection means. And he, he uses the same analogy of a seed. He said, when you bury the seed, you bury it in, in its kind, but you don't know what kind is going to be resurrected. So again, he uses the reference of our body as a seed that will be planted in our death. It is buried corruptible, but it is raised incorruptible. Here he's talking about burying yourself, dying yourself. The Apostle Paul made this statement, I die daily, which simply meant in Paul's life, in order to continue the path that God had called him to be, he must die to the old self, die to the old Paul every day. And he, he went on to Galatians 2.20 and said, I am crucified with Christ. I identify with that crucifixion so that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I live in this flesh, I live by faith in the blessed Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I found something else. I want you to listen to this. Farmers in Oklahoma during the late 1930s faced an excruciating choice. Throughout 1920s, rain had been plentiful, the harvest abundant. Many city workers had left their factory jobs in the Northeast for a chance of the fortune in the great Midwest. The stock market crash of 1929 motivated even more people to leave the East and go to the Midwest. By the fall of 19, by, but in 1931, the rains stopped. To make matters worse, years of poor farming techniques had destroyed the grass that preserved the moisture during times of drought. The dry ground resulted in massive dust storms, which destroyed remaining fields. Fortunes were swept away in the clouds of terrifying gray blizzards. By the fall of 1939, thousands of farmers returned empty-handed to the East Coast. Some remained with an excruciating choice. They had just enough grain to feed themselves and their families for another year, but probably not much longer than that. If they planted that seed and no rains came, their families would not survive. But if they planted those seeds and the rains came, they would survive. You see, they had a choice. Take the seeds they had, grind it into flour, their family could eat for maybe a year, and then they didn't know what they would do. Or take that precious 
potential of food and put it in the ground and pray the rains came. Those that planted, their faith was renewed because in 1939, the rains came. I want to say to you this morning, planting always involves rest. When Jesus is saying that if any man follows me, he must plant his life. The planting is dying. I used to think that when you plant something, it lives, but it actually dies and then lives again. We lose control of what we plant. You ever thought about that? I was in Kenya, Nigeria, Tanzania, and had conversations with farmers who, who had seed. And they, they would plow the dry ground. And they kept just enough to eat for strength to plant. And then they trusted God for rain. That was a choice that they had every day. Do I eat now or do I plant for an abundance? And this is exactly what Jesus is talk, calling us to do. To take control off of our lives and give and plant. Be planted. Trusting God to raise a harvest. Seed you plant, you can no longer consume. Jesus said here, I tell you, unless a grain of corn is planted, it will remain a single seed. Well, what has that got to do with what we're saying? Glad you ask. The call of every Christian is to be the part of, we are a part of the body of Christ. And as a body of the Christ, God has turned over to us the work that Jesus Christ himself did when he walked on this earth. Remember, Jesus said, I've come to, be, to serve and not to be served. And that's a heart issue in our lives. Do we want to be served or do we see ourselves as servants? Do we see the blessings that God pours in our life as tools and instruments and assets that we use in serving. You must do this. There is this dying. Let me give you some example. Remember Abraham? Have you ever looked at it that Abraham was ready to plant the hope that God had given him in Isaac? He was willing to plant it. He was willing to put it on an altar and take his life. Remember what God said when he told him, Whoa, Abraham, don't harm the child? He said, I wanted to see if there is anything that you would hold back from me. And I want you to know whether you realize it or where you brush the thought away in your mind and involve yourself with human reason, that is still the call of God to every person every day. The question he wants to ask you is, what is it that you will withhold from God? What is it that you don't trust him with? And you see, the giving away of yourself is an act of trust. Trust and faith being synonymous. You, tr you look at what you give as something you lose. Yet when you look at the agriculture illustration that God gave, the agriculture illustration is, is that you're giving it away in order to receive a harvest. But yet there is that thing that says, do I hold it in my fist and then I make sure that I've got it or do we entrust it to God so that we can say to him with a clear mind and a pure heart, Lord, there is nothing that I will withhold from you. I give you my life because you've given me life. I give you my abilities because you have given me my abilities. I give you my talents because you have given me my talents. I give you my wealth because you have given me wealth. And with the mindset of the heart that says, I'm not losing, I'm planting a harvest, 
The life that you live in this world is going to be a life that is free from the fears that many people fear every day. One is a fear of, oh my goodness, what if I do this? We're instantly inundated. Well, will it fail? Will it succeed? Or do you give it in the spirit that this is what God has given me? I will not hold back anything from me. My trust and faith is in God himself. You see, that's the real issue of life. That's the real heart, heart issue that we face not only that, in Matthew 13, 44 and 45, put that down and read it later. It's a story of two men. One man is walking across a field and he finds a treasure. One man is walking across a field and he finds the biggest pearl in the world. It's called the pearl without price. Now, what does it say that these men do? He says that they went and sold everything in order to obtain the treasure and obtain the pearl. What they found is so priceless that they gave up everything just to obtain it. I want you to know that Jesus Christ, in calling you to salvation, is not calling you to some lazy boy life in Christ. The teachings plainly in the Word of God is this. You sell all. All that you are, all you hope to be, all you have accumulated, there is nothing worthy to stand between you and a full relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the call of a Christian. You see, to be involved in the work of Christ is the same thing as following Christ. You remember the rich young ruler? He came to Jesus excited. I want to follow you. I want to follow you. He was a guy with potential. The rich young ruler means he was a person of standing. And he had great wealth. You know, most churches look at him and say, preacher, that's who we need to go out. Yeah. I think sometimes people say, we're going to go into the fields of harvest and check their bank accounts. And we want those that's got money. Let me tell you about an illustration of someone that gave their all. Jesus was sitting in the treasury, and it was recorded that he was watching all these people come by and just give hunks of money. And then one little old lady walked up with a little mite that wasn't much worth, and she gave it. I think the illustration is this. Number one, she gave it all. She entrusted to her God for her provision in giving to God that might. I don't think she faced a death wish. I don't think she had a fear in her heart. It was her gift to God. And we are sustained by large, medium, and small. What that gift is, is dependent on you and how you look at that gift but it is a fact of giving it away. Now, this church plants seeds. We have things, we have the normal everyday stuff. We have that booger man call the budget. But the one good thing it does, it says that ministries that we have, the people that we give towards, they know that we're planning in order to send them money or to send them teams. We're, that's our heart. That's what we plan with. Let me show you some of the seeds we planted. One of them is in Egypt. A pastor you named Safa that you saw. What's this?
I invite you to come to Egypt with me to get involved in that worship. I want to put a face. When I say that we support church planning in Egypt, you've seen it. Most of those are churches meeting within a church that's already built, and there will be four to five services that will meet in that church during the day. The one you saw with the many praise teams, they had three praise teams. When I went in there to preach and saw three praise teams, I knew it was going to be a long worship service. <laughs> By the time we got through, 450 people were outside waiting for the next church to come in. Your faithfulness of die planting seeds in Egypt. We're going to look at Tanzania. This is a children's home. Uh, their parents uh, either have died with age or are suffering from AIDS. Uh, many children don't have a mom and dad. They live with one of their relatives. But two years ago, you opened it with a $5,000 gift. Made it possible. They eat, they're clothed, they have medical care, they're educated. Over the years, they're now graduating in other encampments. Kids who've gone to college. Kids who will go throughout the world. Many of you, many of you, Sponsor these children. Let's, let's look at this Christ Hope International, Mwanda, Tanzania. Those children have smiles on their faces because they don't go to bed hungry. And that's because you plant every week. Let's talk about a summer splash camp coming. Those of you that work in that will tell you the joy of children being able to just scatter and go over and, and learn in every stop about Jesus where they were shooting a bow and arrow, trying to hit a target with the illustration of when you miss the bullseye, that's sin. To building birdhouses. That's what you invest in. We have a sports ministry. Our, our field is up now. In this late September, you'll be getting that. We have it out there for one reason, to reach kids and to reach parents. You see, everything that we do here is in order to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, to teach them, to disciple them, and then lead them to de reach, teach, and disciple someone else. That's, that's what we do. We don't play games. We don't have big events. We reach people. But what about this week? If you were on Wednesday night, you heard more of it. I just want to talk about a 67-year-old lady who lives in literally a tool shed. No toilet, no sink. A hose for water. And that's it. She has to pay rent for that. She has nothing. The thing that really broke my heart is she's not the only one out there. Do you realize for a moment the people that have no place to live? 605 families in the Flagler school system were counted as families who were homeless. They lived under a bridge. They lived in a car. They lived in the woods. Uh, some of you may be thinking, oh, preacher, that's too big for us. Oh, it's too big for us, but it's not too big for the God that we serve. You see, this is what happens when we get so intent on trying to meet the budget for the year. And the budget is the cow in which we bow to and give to. But when you realize that God has placed in our midst many times stuff we didn't plan on, so what do we do with it? 
Do we send them down to another church? See, I believe that as God reveals, God provides. Manna doesn't fall from heaven anymore. It comes from people whose heart in, are entrusted to God who are not afraid to turn loose and plant in His kingdom. When you look back at the history of the body of Christ, they used to take care of the needs of the community. I recently saw a picture of Mennonites, 300 of them, built a barn, picked it up, and carried it across a couple of fields and put that down in a neighbor's yard. But you see, we begin to look at the government. We have the great programs that we're supposed to take away poverty. We're supposed to help people. And we in the church, we just said, okay, man, that saves us a little money. Everything's going to be fine. And we begin to wonder over the years why people aren't coming to Christ. I want to tell you something. When somebody lives in the woods, when somebody's stomach is growling from hunger, when a family has been destroyed because of sin and a woman is left without a husband with any mean support, when you see people who are, are losing their loved ones, when you see the needs and we don't respond, what is the condition of our heart? You see, the God I serve throughout this Word of God says that He will provide all of our needs according to His riches and glory through Christ Jesus our Lord. And until we get to the point that we stop holding back, holding back is mistrust of God. Holding back is disobedience to God. We're just going to eat and hope things get better rather than plant and watch a harvest come. That's the call of every Christian. Die to yourself and live to Christ. Christianity and the church is not a social club you join. It is a life a fresh life, a new life, a do-over life that God gives us that we may walk in newness of life with newness of mind, newness of heart. Trust in Him. Lay in our proverbial Isaac, whatever that may be in your life, on the altar and raising the knife. What areas of your life have you not, are you not trusting to Christ? See, we're going into an invitation. This, this isn't a speech. We go home and check it off. What areas in your life? I looked at my life. What am I holding back? Is, is there anything that I wouldn't do for the Lord God? What trust? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Maybe that's the heart of your lack of motivation. You've never experienced that new life that Christ gives us. What is your level of faith and trust? Are you willing to plant and be planted? See, God calls the whole thing. He didn't say put your offering in the offering slot. He said, lay yourself on an altar, which is our reasonable sacrifice to God. I speak to the many that are listening to us some way over the internet. There's many who are listening to us right now that really don't have a church that they can come in and get to know and be a part of, of the, the issues of life and things that we do. Many people are at home because of, uh, of health reasons, and I understand that. But I'm going to say to you, if, if that web page or that, that internet is your life, you are suffering because you're out there alone. And God has called you 
He's called you to a group. I, I ask you to consider your local. There are many of you who visit Sunday after Sunday. I challenge you. We're not a perfect church. We're not supposed to be. We're supposed to be a forgiven church. I ask you boldly, come be a part of what we're doing in order that to, we can go in fishing terms from a six-inch cast net, or excuse me, six-foot cast net to a 12-foot cast net, that we can cast our bread on wider fields. You can be a part of us. This morning, the issue behind for us is our heart. You trust God with everything to the point that you're not afraid if He asks you for anything. I'm going to tell you, that's a life of peace. It doesn't matter where God will send you. No matter what He will ask you. There is a sense of peace that knows if my master has sent me, I'm in, I'm in his hand. Fathers, we come to you this morning. Your words are reflective in our mindset of hard sayings. <laughs> because, Lord, we are a consumer society. And Lord, you've called your people to be a producing, giving society. Father, the greatest prayer that I have for my people is that they would know the peace of God that goes with all understanding. That they be a people who fear nothing. That their life rests in Christ can say every day and every night, search me, O Lord, and Know my heart. And Lord, we'll love you with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, our beings, our possessions, all that we are. It's then that we will love our neighbors. We'll give up our seat for someone who needs it. This morning, as our praise team comes and we sing a song of invitation, however God is leading you this morning, I just simply say, come. If you don't quite know, I'm here, Andrew's here, Doug will stop playing in a heartbeat and come. You can meet us in the coffee shop, you meet us here, we're here for you, to serve you. Would you stand as we offer this time of invitation?